we are now going to explore one of the least understood of the arts but one of the most popular the art of the ballet when you go to the ballet do you ever stop and wonder how such beautiful and exciting effects are achieved it all looks so easy every dancer seems to know precisely what he is doing every effect seems so spontaneous who is responsible for this? Who is the creator of all this order? It's the choreographer. Since I'm a choreographer, I'm going to tell you what a choreographer is and does. A choreographer is a composer of dances, but actually he is much more than that. He is a sort of a catalyst who brings together all the various elements that go into the making of the ballet. The story, the music, the scenery and costumes, the lighting and casting, all are of almost equal importance as the ballet itself. It is how to put them together that is the heart of the matter of creating a ballet. The whole must be much greater than the sum of its parts. No matter how well each individual artist does his work, it is whether the choreographer has put these parts perfectly together that is the final test. You may like the music better than the dancing, or vice versa. But even if you like everything equally well, we still have failed if the essential drama resulting from the combined work of all the contributing artists fails to move or excite us at the end of the performance. When we do succeed, there is a sort of a magical communication between the artists on the stage and the people in the audience. This is the important thing. Even the greatest artists cannot explain their own creations. Perhaps you know the story about the lady who bought a Picasso picture, and she said to him, Mr. Picasso, now that I own your picture, I wish you'd explain to me what this picture means exactly to you. Picasso thought for a while, and finally the best answer he could give was, it means to me exactly $50,000. Actually, there is nothing one can say about dancing half as effective as the dancing itself. Let me show you. It is interesting to try and analyze an artwork after it's finished, and at least something of its mechanics can be explained. There are three main sources of material for dance movement. The ballet or theater dance, modern or free dance, and folk or national dance. Each has its own style. In the ballet, there are probably not more than about 30 basic steps. We learn these steps as children at the bar, and when we leave the bar, the teacher puts these different steps together for us in various combinations called enchaînements. The names are all in French. Here is an example. Glissade, assemblée, pas de chat, pas de bourrée, pas de bourrée, Tanier croisé devant, Tanier croisé en arrière, assemblée soutenue, and fifth. Again, glissade, assemblée, pas de chat, pas de bourrée, pas de bourrée, Tanier, Tanier, assemblée soutenue, and fifth. Now, this is a typical conventional ballet enchaînement. Now, I want to introduce to you four of my dancers. They are all soloists from the Chicago Lyric Opera. Barbara Steele, Etta Burrow, Kenneth Johnson, Charles Schick, and Neil Cahan at the piano. Barbara, will you do Balloté, Balloté, Point Tendu, Batman Vent de Jambe, Chasse, and Chene Turns? <laughs> as an adagio.
Barbara, do the same steps now tragically. Take the same step and do it comically. Composers sometimes use their themes upside down. Would you like to try it upside down, Barbara? Dancers must be able to try any crazy thing the choreographer asks of them, because that is the only way we can arrive at something new. Now, Barbara, you and Chuck jazz this enchaînement. <laughs> jam session. That last was a typical jitterbug lift. Now we're going to show you how to develop a more classical lift. It's in four stages. Now do it with a turn. Now jump into it. Now do it without your hands. What you've seen so far is not choreography. It's just exercises both for the choreographer and the dancers. Now the next dance you'll see is completely choreographed. The music is by Delib from the ballet Sylvia. The style is 19th century and shows the conventional mannerisms and steps of the old-fashioned classical ballet.
In the full version of this little ballet, two cupids dance at this point, which gives the soloists a chance to catch their breath. Almost every classical dance has a coda, which means a short, brilliant finale. must always take into account the costumes that the dancers are going to wear because the costumes often dictate the style of the movement. For instance, in a Japanese kimono, the only way you can move is like this. Even in a modern tight Dior dress, if you want to pick something up, you have to go like this. So today, Etta Buro will wear her costume for the next dance because the skirt and even the headdress are part of the choreography. You'll recognize uh, certain basic ballet steps, but they are all used unconventionally. The dance is about two lovers who are flirting outrageously in a moonlit garden. They are married, but not to each other.
An entirely different problem is the dance from the triumphal scene in Aida. No one knows today how the Egyptians used to dance centuries ago, and there's no way of finding out. Yet the choreographer must conjure up an Egyptian mood. So this Aida dance is inspired by the acrobatic positions of the dancers on the Egyptian bas-reliefs, but in no sense copies them. Imagine the soloist surrounded by a large corps of ballet, and they do movements like this. The dancers have round, flat, golden discs on their hands, and they dance like this. Describe it as a kind of an operatic ballet style. turn to a different problem. Etta and Chuck will dance the anvil chorus from Il Trovatore. Here again, no one knows how the Spanish gypsies danced in the 15th century, and even if we did, native dances are rarely theatrical enough for the stage. So you'll see in these movements the flavor of the Spanish gypsy dances, but they are not authentic. We use the round hand movements that the Moors brought from Africa to Spain. We, and which have now become typical flamenco. We use this position, which we call the Spanish S. In classical ballet, the arms, when they're in fifth position, make a soft frame for the face. But in gypsy dancing, the arms are back of the head, the head is down, the elbows are bent, and the wrists come together in a fierce style. The dancing is very fierce, and the hands are an exotic, positions almost like flowers. 
and the dancing is very staccato and rough. Actually, this is another example of operatic ballet style, and you will see them costumed. You have to imagine them costumed in wild gypsy rags. <laughs> me where ideas for ballets come from. Of course the idea is important because the conception dictates the style. In France it is the custom for such great writers as Anouya and Giraudoux, Camus and Sartre to write scenarios or what they call their ballet livres. In fact Giselle, the most famous of all the 19th century ballets, was written by the French poet Théophile Gautier after a poem by Heine. Most of the choreographers in this country invent their own ideas. You might get an idea from listening to a piece of music, or maybe if you read a story that gives you an idea, and then you can have the music especially written for the story. Sometimes I base my ideas, my dances, on poems. The poetry of E. E. Cummings has such a wonderful rhythm to it that you can use it in place of music. Anyone lived in a pretty how town, with up so floating many bells down. Spring, summer, autumn, winter, he sang his didn't, he danced his did. Women and men, both little and small, cared for anyone, not at all. They sowed their isn't, they reaped their same, sun, moon, stars, rain. Another poem by E.E. E. Cummings, which I think would make a wonderful ballet and a very interesting one, is The Cambridge Ladies. The Cambridge ladies who live in furnished souls are unbeautiful and have comfortable minds. Also, with the church's Protestant blessings, daughters, unscented, shapeless, spirited. They believe in Christ and Longfellow, both dead, are invariably interested in so many things. At the present writing, one still finds delighted fingers knitting for the, is it poles, perhaps? while permanent faces coyly bandy scandal of Mrs. N and Professor D. The Cambridge ladies do not care above Cambridge if sometimes in its box of sky lavender and cornelis the moon rattles like a fragment of angry candy. Or if you want a comedy, the cow is in the hammock, the kitten's in the lake, the baby's in the garbage can. What difference does it make? Sometimes one line suffices. Tonight the moon by languorous memories obsessed lies pensive and awake, a sleepless beauty. This is a poem by Baudelaire from The Flowers of Evil and translated by George Dillon. So you see how many ideas there are. Many choreographers think that the simpler the idea, the better the ballet. I personally challenge the idea of exciting and very complicated stories, but sometimes a Viennese waltz is best. <laughs>
Next time, the pas de deux. Literally translated from the French, pas de deux means steps of two. That is, a classical dance performed by a man or a woman. You'll see how from awkward beginnings we finally arrive at complicated choreographies in which the human body is completely idealized. <laughs> This is National Educational Television.